<laughs> My name's Anna Trapido and I, I'm a chef and a food anthropologist and I wrote a book called Hunger for Freedom which is the story of food in the life of Nelson Mandela. You know, partly it's just a kind of slightly curious way that my brain works, um, in that I always want to know what people had for lunch. Um, but more seriously, food tells us everything about who people are. It tells you, you can say, I love you with food, you can say, I hate you with food, you can learn about people's culture, you can learn if they're rich or poor. In a South African context, food and land are so bound up, you know, who owns the land determines what gets grown. and you know, what gets grown determines what people eat. So really, I think it's food is a nice way of examining a, a whole life rather than just looking at the kind of purely political aspects of that life. The interesting thing about Mandela and food is that he's very, he's a very gregarious person. He likes being with other people. He likes being around a table. He is very sociable. He's very interested in food from other cultures. So, and he's very interested in in engaging with the people who make that food. So, you know, if he's in Japan, he will kind of with great ebullience go in and try Japanese food that. You know, his Greek friends, you know, he's really, at, at George Bezos's birthday, 75th birthday party, he had two helpings of lamb. And actually he was quite disciplined about portion size usually. So, you know, a great sort of enthusiasm, but partly, more than anything else, that's about being interested in the people who make the food. And I think that partly his... His enthusiasm about other people's food comes from a very clear sense that the food that his mother made, that he grew up with, um, is enormously valuable to him. You know, that if you love yourself and your own food culture, then you can bounce off into the world and, you know, enjoy other people's food culture because you've got such a good foundation. And, you know, at heart, what he liked most of all was the food of his Eastern Cape childhood. You know, I think he's, you know, he is a complex human being and he uses food in all sorts of ways. So one thing is that he just, he, he endlessly in his letters writes about what an enthusiastic eater he is. And um, he, so he likes food as point number one, um, but that he also understands that food can be a tool for creating um, either political or social um, comfortableness so that he uses, um, he very explicitly at the beginning of his presidency uh, engages with Afrikaans food culture and says how much he likes, for instance, Cook Sisters, which is a very classic Afrikaans dessert, because what he's trying to communicate is that he values the people that make that dish. So. He understands that food can be a message as well as just lunch. Uh, for starters, all the diets in prison, in South African prisons, up until the early 1980s were racially discriminatory. So African prisoners got different rations to uh, coloured and Indian prisoners and white prisoners got different rations again. That Within that, most of the food was being stolen by gangsters anyway, so, you know, that, that even those rations were not actually happening. That in Robben Island, there are several, especially in the 1960s, very significant hunger strikes that Madiba and his comrades take part in, from which they gain significant concessions. So, you know, that they, in a situation where you have no power, the power not to eat, the hunger strike, was, was really one of their only tools. And they used it very effectively that, for instance, it was a hunger strike that allowed people for the first time to, prisoners to be given access to children under 16 who were not allowed onto Robben Island. And one of the hunger strikes 
um, got that concession. What's lovely about the gardening is, is he's clearly using nurturing plants as both a metaphor that he uses in letters because he writes about the plants quite a lot. Um, but it's also a way, you know, he, this is a man who desperately wants to look after his family, you know, who's worried about his wife and his children, um, who's made this enormous personal sacrifice and cannot look after them, you know, he, he is physically distanced. So the amount of sort of emotional intensity that goes into the tomato plant, um, and there's a terrible painful prison letter where he nurtures this tomato plant and it dies. And you can see this as a metaphor for his marriage, you know, that, that he's sort of feeling, I, I couldn't even look after the plant, let alone my own children. Um, so, and once he got out of prison, you know, because the obsessional gardening in prison, just driving everybody insane with how much he was gardening, and it was just his thing, and he was still doing it at Polesmore, and but the moment that he got out of prison, A, he was busy, but also, he could look after real people and you know he could be part of a family unit and so you don't need tomatoes to be your kind of surrogate family that somehow I mean I don't have a sense of him gardening particularly in his old age that there was a very nice man who gardened in his house and he liked that and sometimes he talked to the gardener but he stopped being obsessed with his um, little kind of vegetable patch because I think it was a, a way of trying to, to nurture something, you know? Well, the first meal was a bit of a disaster in a way, um, that they couldn't get into Soweto, so they, they spent the night at Bishop Tutu's house, because Soweto was just so excited that Madiba's desire was to go home immediately, and the, the advice was that they simply wouldn't be able to get into Soweto because everybody was in the streets being excited that he was coming home. So they go to Bishop Tutu's house, and there was a lovely housekeeper called Lillian Ngoboza, who was Bishop Tutu's housekeeper. She was all on her own in the house, that Bishop Tutu was in Johannesburg, that you know, nobody else was there, and they said, oh, by the way, Nelson Mandela's coming this evening. This is and it's 27 years since anybody has had any kind of social contact with him and nobody knows what he likes to eat and it's a Sunday so all the shops were shut, you know, South Africa in 1990 was quite different to what it is now that everybody was in church on a Sunday and the shops were closed. So, you know, that she rushes around, she finds what she can and she makes a chicken curry because she thinks that's you know, everybody likes that. And in South Africa, that's kind of become the national dish in a way. So she made a chicken curry, um, and she, you know, Bishop Tutu, who had, um, he hitched a ride from Joba with some journalists, so he couldn't get on a plane, so he hitched a ride. He left his wife behind by mistake. So, you know, Mrs. Tutu wasn't there because he was so excited to get on the plane. But Bishop Tutu likes rum and raisin ice cream. So they had rum and raisin ice cream because that's what you always have at Bishop Tutu's house. So it was chicken curry and rum and raisin ice cream. And then the next morning, Lillian Ngoboza said she knocked on the door of the bedroom um, and Winnie Mandela came to the door and she said to Winnie, does your husband like tea or coffee in the mornings? And Winnie said, I don't know. Because, you know, if you haven't lived together for nearly 30 years, you know, these, the, the minutiae of domestic life. She didn't know what he liked to have for breakfast. You know. you know, he's very interesting in all sorts of ways. Um, so, all sorts of things, and some of them are just daft little things, and some of them... But, you know, more than anything, what was wonderful about the project was getting a sense of Mandela as part of a collective and part of a group of extraordinary people who changed the world together for the better. That, you know, he was always very keen to say that he, was, he wasn't a lone agent, that he was part of a team. And being with members of that team was just such an honour and a privilege. You know, they really are, you know, Walter Sisulu, um, Ahmed Kathrada, all of those people, Joe Matthews, Winnie Mandela, they are astonishing people that, who changed the world for the better. And 
what was lovely was, you know, of course it's not perfect, um, but to be around people who know that they change the world and that it, it's better as a result is, you know, very inspirational, that they are a terrific generation. Um, and I think South Africa is very lucky to have them, that if you look at other freedom struggles where people, as soon as liberation was achieved, people started fighting. And, you know, if you look at other freedom struggles, quite often there are mystery car crashes just before the first election. And, you know, people get kind of bumped off. The South African liberation movement, those people, they didn't just share political ideals, they loved each other. And I think it shows in this kind of settlement that they achieved. Light Frosties with warm milk, which I have to say was not his finest decision. I, I've tried it and it's disgusting. But, um, so yeah, on that level, Frosties.